back with another episode of In the Bag with Unc and Adam. Neely, we were talking about this before we hit record. Spring ball is flying by. Uh, tomorrow, uh, Later today on Saturday, Colorado is going to be conducting their ninth spring practice and just a couple weeks away from that spring game. Man, we are officially over halfway, you know, mathematically well over halfway now. You get 15 practices. The 15th is the spring game, so it's really only 14, and we're already at number nine. It is flying by, man. What have you observed from this team since they came back from spring break? Uh, that they hit the ground running. I, I think last year's team came back after spring break with a little more rust on them. Uh, you know, did not individually or collectively do things to stay in shape over the break. Uh, this team reported back at 100%. Everybody made the team meeting. Everybody was at the first practice. It's just a totally different mindset when you see these guys in the building or see them at practice that they're taking it much more serious uh, than this time last year. So I would just say that it, there's almost more of a professional vibe to it uh, than just kids having fun, college students coming back from spring break and talking about what they did. Their focus while they were on spring break was to get back here and get ready for football. I think it really disrupts them, you know, that we had that one week on and then going right into the break. So they they hit the ground running. I was impressed with it. Yeah, and uh, we've gotten some great insights this week from Coach Mathis and Coach Flea talked to the media this week and kind of broke down their positions with Coach Mathis, what really stood out to me was the comments he had about DJ McKinney and Preston Hodge. It sounds like those two guys have really uh, lived up to expectations through their their first eight practices with the Buffs. I think they've exceeded it, man. I really do. You know, when you're when you're recruiting guys and getting guys from the portal, it's almost like a buyer beware kind of thing. Uh, you know, you 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 can look at the stats, you can look at film, but you don't know the kid. You know, you really haven't coached them. And so you're looking for like this baseline of performance of say, well, I hope we get this out of it. I, I hope he's right here and we can coach up the rest. Man, those two guys, not only their athletic prowess and their in their in their IQ, their game IQ, uh, they have emerged as leaders on the team. They're vocal. You know, they're making sure people are in the right places at the right time. They're doing their job and they know the job of other people. Uh, you know, I think they have hit the ground running, man, and exceeded expectations from this coaching staff. I've seen both of them get interceptions at practice. I've seen both of them chastise people for effort. I've seen them encourage the defensive line, the linebackers, you know, to to let's get this thing together. You see them engage with the coaches in team meetings. Uh, I think that you really got more bang for the buck out of them that, than you were anticipating. And obviously the versatility of that defensive backfield has really stood out. There's more guys that have cross-trained, it seems, and played different positions during their CU career, uh, whether it's been brief or they were on the team last year, than guys that have specialized on one position. It, it feels like there's so many in interchangeable parts back there. Yeah, and I think that has a lot to do with, with individual football IQ. You know, there's one thing to have size and be a weight room guy, but to know the position that you play in the positions around you, it helps for easier transitions to move pieces around. Uh, you look at even the offensive line, uh, you know, Rock, Tyler Brown, he can play center, he can play both the guard positions. Uh, if you go back to the defense side of the ball, you can move a Trevor Woods from safety down to linebacker. People always say, oh, he's too small for linebacker. But I think his his mental uh, approach to the game, his IQ, his football IQ makes up for that. And it's the same thing on with the rest of them. You know, safeties, you know, whether Shiloh or Caramel Silver Craig or the new guys coming in, their football IQ as well as their physical uh, traits make them easier to move around and do different things with. All right, let's jump into the mailbag here. Shy in the buff asked, any leaders stepping up at the midway point of spring practices? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think you know, uh, Hodge and McKinney, the names we just mentioned. Uh, I think Shane Cokes on the defensive line, you know, who was a leader last year, now coming back as that veteran, helping those new guys transition in. I'm very impressed with the across-the-board leadership of this new offensive line. You know, whether it's Jordan Seaton on one end all the way to Khalil Benson on the other and everybody in the middle, those guys have really coalesced and look like they've been playing together you know, two years, and they get after it. They get after each other. They push each other. Uh, and then you still have, 
You know, the quiet leaders, I call the quiet leaders on the scene, you know, Shador Sanders and Travis Hunter are not rah-rah guys. You know, they're not standing up on top of, you know, a water cooler making a passionate speech. That's just not, you know, what they do, but they lead by example and they lead in small groups and telling people how we need to operate and focus. And so you see, you see Shador challenging, uh, you know, the receivers and the tight ends about missed assignments. Uh, you see Shiloh on the defensive side of the ball doing the same thing from their safety position. Uh, and so I think that, one thing you clearly have this year, different from last year, you not only have talent upgrades at each position, you have personality upgrades where you have leaders in the locker room. You have extensions, you know, of the position coaches and the extension of Coach Prime in the locker room. Shine the Buff also asked, do you have a favorite storyline about a new player or returning players off season? You know, one that just jumps out to me, uh, Khalil Benson has a, a shellfish allergy, and as much as everybody loves – you know, the cookings of, of Carl Solomon uh, in the uh, in the cafeteria there. It's always funny to see when we have shrimp or crab cakes or crab uh, legs, you see Khalil getting out of line and going to talk to the chef about his special dish for the day. Uh, and so he loves to tell the story about when he realized he had a shellfish allergy. He was eating at the casino in Tunica, Mississippi, and, it's, and he started to swell up. And so he really avoids, you know, the cafeteria sometimes because there's a lot of shellfish uh, most days, but they do a great job in separating it just for him and taking care of his specific menu. And there's a, a lot of just feel good stories across the board on this team. You look at Tyler Brown being eligible, um, sticking in that offensive line. Hank Zelensky is somebody that uh, was recruited by the former coaching staff and coach prime comes in. His staff decides that they like what they see on film. They bring him in. He plays a couple of different roles as a true freshman. And now, you know, he's he's in the mix out there. Um, I've been impressed with Bonta Bentley and what he showed last season. A lot of guys would have gotten discouraged, uh, you know, or about was it three or four weeks into the season when he wasn't getting the playing time maybe he expected, but then finishes the season really good. And by the way, his his new TTP merch is pretty cool. Have you seen that? Yeah. I have, man. Trust the process. Shout out to Bentley. Shout out to all the guys, you know, who do their own merchandise and truly take advantage of this NIL landscape. But, you, but you're right, Adam. There are a lot of feel good stories, uh, you know, across the board. I would I would say you're spot on with that Tyler Brown one getting to play this year. Uh, I used to tell Tyler, you know, last year when he was, you know, having to sit out that, man, it's really a blessing in disguise, you know, that you're going to get to be a part of a revamped offense, a revamped offensive line. Uh, and, and play with that and be able to switch positions and that kind of thing. But, you know, Hank man has been out there with the ones at center, you know, and Tyler has been to uh, been to his right. Uh, so I think this, this offensive line is also going to be a good story when we get further down the, the line into August and especially into the season, when people see how much better this offensive line is compared to last year. And we talked about Preston Hodge already. This is a young man that started out at Navarro college and he keeps battling again, kind of like Bentley, just didn't get discouraged. Uh, he goes out to Liberty. He was their top graded defensive player on a team that went undefeated till they played Oregon. And now uh, he's getting coached by the, the greatest defensive back of all time. And so it's been a, that's a cool story. And then just one last thing here, Neely, is just seeing guys like Omari and Miller and Tajay McCoy kind of take advantage of maybe their positions not being at full strength due to some injuries and maybe some guys not being on campus yet. Um, it's been fun to, to see them. It seems like every day when I'm watching the videos from you and, and well off media and reach the people, it seems like Omari oh, Miller's making a play almost every day out there. You know, one of the things I love about this dynamic before all of the receivers get here, uh, you know, coach prime loves to put the twos against the ones, the two defense uh, against the one offense and, and vice versa. So, when you have uh, uh, the one defense out there, which is going to include a Travis Hunter, uh, then you have the two offense going against it. So every day at practice, that freshman from last year who had that breakout game that Michael Irvin just came over and hugged him and, and really poured into him, every day at practice, man, whether whoever shows up in these position battles start, you know, you got a Mario going against Travis Hunter every day. How is that not going to make him better and more prepared than to not only compete on this team, but to compete, you know, in the fall when football really starts? So a lot of stories like that across the board about guys giving it their all. Uh, I mean, Preston Hodge, as we've talked about, has been phenomenal out there on defense. And when you look at what this defensive staff brings to the table, as you said, Adam, not only the, the number one corner 
uh, to ever play the game. Uh, debatably, the number one athlete to ever play the game. Surely he's in the top three uh, in NFL history. You got Kevin Mathis, who had about a 10-plus year NFL career. And then you add in uh, Robert Livingston as the defense coordinator, spent 12 years with the Bengals on the scout staff, knowing what it's supposed to look like, and then 10 uh, coaching the corners. What better training can a Preston Hodge or anybody in that secondary get than to have those three people pouring into you and getting you ready for this season and potentially NFL? One of my favorite usernames, Buck and Fuffalo asked. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. We just <laughs> – that is a good one. That might be the best one yet. Buck and Fuffalo. Yeah, it's going to be hard to beat that. He asked, enough interior defensive line talent and beef this year – to hold the offensive line or hold the line of scrimmage question mark. What do you think? Do they have enough beef this year on the interior of that defense line? I think we do, but I also think that this may uh, portal is going to be uh, something that gives us more. I think we're going to add one or two uh, new pieces uh, going into the fall camp with the may portal. And I think you're going to see those guys play uh, the ones that, that uh, look to be coming in the future. Having said that, the ones that are currently here, uh, I think are doing an exceptional job. When you see them go against the offensive line, uh, it is a battle iron is sharpening iron. Uh, I think that when you look at uh, a Warren Sapp pouring into them and helping teach them and guide them, they can only be better. When we left uh, last season, we knew there were a couple of areas we had to absolutely get better in. Uh, offensive line play, defensive line play, and it tight end. And defensive Line play is purely stop and run. We gave up too many explosive plays last year on big runs at crucial moments. This line under Coach Prime is designed to stop the run. So I'm looking forward to be able to do just that. I think we got the weight, the strength, the size to play ball on that side of the line of scrimmage versus getting pushed away. The transfer portal opens on Monday. Uh, probably not ideal, right? You'd probably like to have your spring ball concluded by then. Are the, Do you think there's any advantage to um, – and having them kind of overlap? Uh, I, you know, I'm not sure. Uh, because I think you can spin it where it's best for the programs. I think you can spin it where it's best for the student athlete. Uh, and then you can spin it to where it's, it's harmful. I think, like, for instance, for the student athlete, that it helps them should they participate and stay all the way through the spring game because now they got spring game film and they got more opportunity to show what they can do and, and showcase themselves. Uh, but I also think, you know, in the real world that we live in, Adam, a lot of the people who are who will be transferring out of other programs are transferring out of the CU program. They knew before spring break, they knew in February that they, that they were going to leave uh, and they were just waiting on that moment to open up. Uh, so I think after Monday going into the week of spring ball, you're going to see some people transition out of this program because they have seen, you know, where they kind of stack up and seen where the opportunities may be better somewhere else. But that same door that swings that's letting people out is going to also swing and let people in. Uh, so I don't know if there's an advantage to it being before, you know, April 27th for us or a disadvantage. I just think it is what it is. I think there are players who have always known that, you know, they're going to be getting out of here. Not And not just here. I mean, whatever school they are. I don't think it has anything to do with the date that you make up your mind, you know, at midnight on a specific date. I think I think you've already been working on it. And there there is a one clear benefit to it from a Colorado standpoint in the sense that guys are going to be hitting the portal on beginning on Monday. And then you've got 12 days to kind of figure out some guys that you can bring out on a visit and mm -hmm. they can experience the spring game and go to the little Wayne concert and yeah, really absolutely. take in Boulder, you know. Absolutely. That's why I think that I I, I think it's, it's whatever side you want it to be on. You know, if, if you want to pout about it, you can spin it to be a negative thing. But if you look at what you just captured, you know, it could be a totally a positive thing. But I just know this. It is what it is. When it opens, it's going to open and there's going to be people transitioning out. And we're going to be doing everything we can to get people to transition in. Buffs 94, he asked, I really liked Kofi Taylor Barrick's sheer athleticism. Any updates on if he might play some special teams this year and how he is progressing? Obviously, he is a project, but an incredibly athletic one. Yeah, I think you're spot on that he's a, he's a player that has some developing to do, uh, but it's hard to match his energy uh, and enthusiasm, and he's very coachable. And as the questioner asks, uh, very athletic in what he brings to the table. Uh, I think he does have a, a future in special teams. The, the One of the issues that you have out there with linebacker, uh, you know, we talked about Bentley earlier. 
Uh, you talked about, you know, Jeremiah Brown that's, that's still here. You got a Trevor Woods moving down from safety. So now your numbers start to get crowded. And also you're looking at bringing in one or potentially two linebackers from the portal. I don't know where Kofi stacks up in all that for this season uh, or what his you know plans may be, but he certainly brings a lot to the table athletically and with the upside. So finding a home on special teams and letting these veterans play this year is just a matter of, you know, does he stick around for that or does he take opportunities to look somewhere else? That's just the nature of college football that we're in. Uh, I would hope that he stays, but uh, I think it's pretty clear on the depth chart that there are other linebackers further along than he is. PCIA buff asked, according to two separate people on X, Cormani McLean recently became a deacon through a local Boulder church. Can you confirm this? I saw the tweet about that, and I think someone was alluding to uh, that he had missed a team meeting or practice, you know, because he was being installed as a deacon. I did not know that to be, you know, fact or fiction. If it is fact, man, hats off to anyone who is, you know, trying to get their life together and have a better relationship with the creator. Would do nothing but applaud that. Uh, Cormani was at practice Thursday, uh, was not dressed to participate, but was there uh, going through some mechanics on the sidelines. Uh, so I don't know anything at all about the accuracy of becoming a deacon here or not, uh, but he was at practice this past Thursday. Awesome. Thanks for that update. Um, next question comes from King KB. He asked, do you think NIL and the transfer portal has changed teams thinking at CU or elsewhere about how soon to play blue chip recruits? I'm wondering how much teams fear spending big on players that sit on the bench their freshman year and could transfer before ever seeing the field that is uh it, it is a new day and age in college football uh as far as colorado goes i don't see and, and correct me if i'm wrong here neely but i don't see coach prime putting somebody out there that's not ready just because they were a blue chip recruiter they're making nil money i think you know we even saw it with the way he brought cormani along last year it's not you're a starter from day one just because you were a five-star recruit what, what are your thoughts on this i i think you nailed it uh, to the to the questioner, that may be an issue across college football uh, that you don't want to lose somebody uh, because people want opportunity and opportunity means playing time. Uh, so I get where there could be some rub there uh, between what the player wants and the coaching staff thinks is best. But here in Colorado, uh, Coach Prime, Deion Sanders, is going to put the best 11 on the field no matter what unit is out there, whether that's special teams, offense, or defense. And if you're not in one of those 11, you know, I don't care what you were touted as, how many stars you had, you know, what your NIL or collective, you know, uh, partnerships may be. You're not going to see the field if you're not ready. If you can't help us win, you're not going to see the field. If you can't help us win in the short term or down the road, you probably don't even have a future on the team with Coach Prime as a head coach because it is about, you know, winning ball games and having people around that are in the best interest, uh, you know, of that happening. So I don't see by any stretch of imagination in Colorado – uh, someone's stars, recruitment level, collective NIL level, guaranteeing them some form of playing time so they don't pout and leave. Coach Prime doesn't roll that way. What's crazy, though, is this NIL market where you've got somebody like Bear Alexander that enters the transfer portal and then USC boosters come up with some money and then he stays there. Uh, we saw it with DJ Lundy committing to Colorado and then FSU, uh, you know, ponies up what they pony up and, and he's still there. So um, it is a new day and age in college football. It's not going to change anytime soon, but uh, you know, these coaches are, there's a, so much pressure on them to win football games. I think it's going to be pretty rare, even at other schools, that they're putting guys out there that aren't ready just because of the NIL agreement that, that's in place. That would surprise me. Absolutely, man. And to, to, to put a pin, excuse me, to put a pin on that point, Adam, I think also what coaches are going to have to do is just what's being done here in Colorado. Coaches are going to have to get back to coaching. Coaches are going to get have to get back to player development. It's one thing for everybody to go after these same power five guys and throw collective and NIL money at them to sign them. Uh, but what about going after that four or three star or going after that kid that was no star and coaching them up to that level and beyond? Uh, you know, that is still something that this staff is capable of. When you, when, you know, we just mentioned on defense. What can Coach Prime, Kevin Mathis, and Robert Livingston not do with a cornerback? Uh, you know, so I don't think they're worried about 
we got to get this guy. I got to promise him this. Got to make sure it happens or else. No, we can take that Bill Belichick approach, get a guy that's a tier or two lower than that and develop him into what he can be. Uh, so I don't think I don't see that budging at Colorado where you're going to have leverage just because of who you are and what you're making that now you're afforded uh, playing time just so you don't leave. OMG, you're dumb asked. Most people have preconceived notions about Coach Prime. Does Coach Prime have a positive trait that people who don't know him well wouldn't have guessed? Or do many people have preconceived notions about Coach Prime that are far from the truth? Yeah, I, I think all of that happens. And uh, I think that people do not realize that Neon Dion or Prime Time are separate entities from Deion Sanders, you know, uh, the father, the head coach, the businessman, the person. Uh, I think that people look at his playing days and his charisma and think that he's an I guy uh, when he's really absolutely a we guy. You know, whether it's myself or, or coaches on the staff, he reminds us constantly, you know, you don't work for me. You work with me. Uh, you're not here, uh, you know, to, to service me. We're in this thing together. And so he very much is a we guy. And I think people don't understand it or appreciate that uh, because the spotlight has been on him, what, probably since 1985, 1984, that this guy has been a household name, you know, for, for the better part of 35 to 40 years. And I, and I don't know if people can separate that because of the attention he gets that they don't understand that he is a very caring and sharing individual and does all he can to put the spotlight on people around him and wants you to utilize his spotlight for for your benefit. So I think people get that confused that Coach Prime is an I guy when he's really absolutely a we guy. One of the things that stood out to me that Robert Livingston has said a couple times is that he appreciates that Coach Prime is the same person every day, you know, and, and he said that in the past, he's worked for guys that are kind of all over the place, and it makes it really kind of depressing going into the building when you don't know what head coach you're going to get and, and who yeah. you're going to be working for that day. So I, I thought that was an interesting comment that he made. That's, that's absolutely true. I didn't hear Coach Livingston when he made that, but I will co-sign it. Uh, and Coach Prime doesn't change based on audience. You know, I have seen him uh, in a room where he and I are the only two black guys and it's the same message if it was a room full of black people. I've seen him speak to, you know, female staffers, male staffers, uh, travel on the road for speaking engagements. His message and who he is and what he believes, you know, does not change based on the audience. So I think Robert Livingston is exactly right. You know what you're going to get when when he's involved uh, because he tells you up front. Uh, he holds to that uh, and doesn't shy away from being the person that he is and, and believes that God has led him to be so. He is what you get. He's authentic. Uh, I think people get caught up into the marketing stuff and don't understand that there's another layer, a much deeper layer of the person, Deion Sanders, under that. All right. One last question for this episode. It comes from Padre Murph. He asked, what game are you most looking forward to next year? I would assume he means this coming season. This is a this is a good question. What What game are you most looking forward to? You know, I, I want to give you the coach talk and say that we're just taking them one week at a time. Uh, but then that would just me be BSing you, Adam. We're partners, so I'm not going to BS you <laughs> when we get in the bag. Uh, I'm looking forward uh, to that Baylor game, uh, which will be the first Big 12 game when we have it at home. And then I'm looking forward uh, to, although it's not going to be the first road game because we open up on the road, uh, I'm looking forward to that that Central Florida game uh, because I really think that the that, that Baylor game and the Central Florida game are going to be true measuring sticks for how we have developed and grown this program. Uh, you know, the North, North Dakota State starting off with them, not a slouch. They are at the top of what they do, and that can be challenging if we're not ready. Uh, the next two games, you know, we played them last year and and we won no matter what the ebb of the flow of the game was, you won. But those two games after that, uh, that Baylor at home and then UCF on the road, I think those are going to be the ones where we get to say, okay, which direction is this team, this program really blowing and going? Because those are going to be good measuring sticks for us. When I get asked this question, I always want to go with the first game because – and that's from a professional standpoint. We spend all off season talking about the team, and then preseason camp is a is a grind for everybody, even the people covering the team. And everybody is ready. Well, maybe some of the coaches want more preparation time, but everybody else 
is so ready for that season to kick off by the time it finally does. And so it's hard to beat that feeling of that initial game and kicking off the season. Mm -hmm. But I mean, th there's so many on the schedule this year at Nebraska. Yeah. It's now been 14 years since the Huskers have beaten the Buffs. And there's currently no future games against these two programs on the schedule. So you want bragging rights going into this next stretch. Uh, you you got to keep that streak alive. I'm from That's a, non, a big one. Yeah, from a non-football standpoint, I'm looking forward to that UCF game. I've never been to Orlando before. And then at Kansas, at Arrowhead Stadium, Joe's Barbecue, the Z-Man sandwich is the best thing I've ever eaten in my life. And so uh, to be in that neighborhood, uh, to get some Kansas City barbecue, uh, that's – but would Coach Prime say CSU? Would that be his answer here? I, I, I think he would – I think he would give you the coach talk. Uh, but I also think it would be sincere. It's gonna is one. The goal is to go one and zero uh, each week. Uh, but you can also, you know, kind of speculate that that Colorado State one does have a little extra meaning based on what happened last year. Uh, so I, I think that man, it's really hard to choose when I laid out what I laid out and you laid out what you laid out. You, you can justify just about you know any game because I was forgetting about that we actually play in Arrowhead uh, when we play there. So that is gonna give us opportunity to go get some of that barbecue. Yep, definitely. Well, Colorado is going to conduct their 10th spring practice later today. Or is it? No, it's the ninth spring practice. Ninth, today, right? ninth practice. Ninth, today. ninth today. Well, we'll let you get out there and, and cover that. But as always, Neely, I appreciate you for taking the time out to another episode of In the Bag, In the Bag. Love it. Let's do it. All right. Thanks, everybody out there for tuning in.